Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second Patreon broadcast. I'm excited that we've made it this far. A month is pretty good. So congratulations, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be answering some more questions like I did last time. Um, looks like um, it's good. I've got uh, four or five questions. And I, I had one from Nikhil last time that I didn't answer. Uh, so I'm going to pull that up over here and do that one first once I figure out where it is. Oh, here we go. You know what? I actually can't find it. Sorry, Nikhil. I'll do it next time. Uh, but I will come from the list here. Uh, so the first one I get is from Oliver Linton. Uh, following my previous question, and perhaps for the benefit of any budding game designers, drawing from your experience and entrenched industry wisdom, which game design mentalities or habits would you advise new designers to adopt and which to avoid? OK, so that's, that's a pretty big question. Um, in general, uh, I think, and uh, I'm probably thinking about this because Tony and I recorded the first episode of, of the podcast that I'm going to uh, be releasing for Patreon last night. And a lot of it was about how uh, the discipline of game design is almost entirely about communication. And you can't actually be that successful at it without good communication. And so I would say probably the best mentality to assume as a game developer, especially if you're going to be working in a team, is that uh, most of what you're going to be doing is defending the player in the development process to uh, the rest of your teammates. Because the rest of your teammates, their, their goals is going to be based on uh, their roles, right? The artists want to make it look as beautiful as possible. Uh, the animators want their animations looking as beautiful as possible. The programmers want elegant code, you know, efficient, that sort of thing. Game design is really the only profession where we're called upon to say, all right, guys, look, we, we, we have all of these constraints. We have all of these things that we need to do, and we only have so much ability to do them. So let's focus on the things that will be most beneficial to the player. And a lot of time, that's going to be um, very difficult <laughs> to communicate to the, the rest of uh, the team, right? Because if let's say... Uh, uh, you've gone to user testing and you know that your users particularly hate some aspect of the game because it's too, uh, something's annoying about it, say. Uh, your job is going to be come, to come back to the team and try to convince them that not only something that they created, but something that they worked very hard on and probably just finished doing multiple 24-hour shifts on has to be changed fundamentally for the benefit of the player. So your, So communication in that regard is going to be the most important skill you can uh, develop as a, a, a game designer. Uh, one of the most shocking things to me when I first became a game designer is how, how few people want to actually read uh, the, the, the output of our craft, right? Like uh, a lot of times what we think that we're creating is game design documents, right? And then that document is going to sit there and everybody on the team is going to respect that because it's the document and they're going to read it and everything will go according to plan. At least this is the incredibly naive view that I had when I was a beginner. In actuality, people will not read anything that's longer than, say, a page. Uh, Mark Cerny used to say that uh, for your entire game, the most you'll need is four pages. And he was right uh, because anything longer than that becomes self-defeating in a way, because once it gets too long, people don't read it. And when they don't read it, they just try to do what they think you were going for. And then that doesn't work out too well, because that wasn't what you were going for. And then now that that whole chain of communication, if you've been able to keep that intact, uh, it couldn't it wouldn't have spiraled so far out of control before you need to wrench it back in. And often, when it spirals that far out of control, you can't wrench it back in. There's just no more time to do that. So what I found is the best way uh, 
to communicate that stuff, there's a couple of ways. One is through very short documents or emails to specific people addressing very specific problems. But I don't even do that as much these days um, as uh, generally I'll, I'll actually walk over to someone's desk or meet with them or call them and have a discussion about what's going on. You know, uh, In the case that you're working with people like programmers and artists who are, are producing actual content uh, that is based on stuff you've designed, the, the more often you can take time and go meet with those people and talk about what it is that you're that you want and what they want and ways to get those two things very close together, I found that that generally is going to give you more often better results and closer to what you were trying to get in the first place than if you wrote out in exacting detail every single thing that you want. And that's for several reasons. Because A, you're never going to get exactly what you wrote in the document. And if you do, usually when you get it back, you're like, oh. I didn't take a couple things into account. And so you're going to get that back, and you're going to need to revise it anyway. So you might as well be doing that while you're going along. Um, what I would say to avoid is uh, try to avoid my way or the highway when you're, when you're dealing with your coworkers. You know, um, I found generally that when people employ that strategy, uh, they end up not getting what they want because the very act of saying, no, you must do what I want, makes people resist what you want. Uh, so generally, like uh, avoid dictating and move towards communication. Right? So that's one thing. Um, another thing that I see a lot of new designers do that, that causes them trouble is they... Uh, there's, they want to do this many things, right? And their level is this big. So they try to cram as much of that as possible into that one level or one piece of content that they're making. And it, it comes across as very scattered and players have a very hard time dealing with it. The most often, the way I see this is, hi Mary, I can still see you. <laughs> Mary, everybody. Um, uh, let's see, where was I? Yeah, so most often the way I see this is uh, they'll have one part of a level to design and the first piece of content will be an entire complex interaction. Like say, uh, say the level had to be some platforming with light combat, right? The first challenge would be intensely complex platforming combined with intensely complex combat. And then the second thing would be a completely different example of intensely complicated platforming and intensely complicated combat. And essentially, the with each piece of the level, the sink was being thrown completely out, and a new kitchen sink was being added in. And uh, the way that tends to come across to players is as very scattered and confusing and not satisfying because it doesn't tend to ramp up from something very... Uh, uh, possible to grasp to something that once they've mastered all the steps in between becomes possible for them to grasp but they might not have thought they could do that at the beginning so what you want to do more than uh, and this is actually what the, the blog this week is going to be on what you want to do more than coming up with a whole bunch of different things to do in every piece of content that you create you kind of want to uh, you start slow, you introduce them to one concept, then you introduce them to another concept, and then you build on those concepts together, right? And then now you introduce another concept and start building it into the concepts that you've built before in the level. And by doing that, you're sort of leading the player along, um, you're, 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 you're leading them through learning a series of skills to get to the point where they're doing the, the, the most complicated, the most interesting aspect of what you started showing them at the end. And what that gives you is a very satisfying curve of intensity along the course of your level. And the trick I usually use to do that, which I kind of hinted at in the last blog post, is like, let's okay, so let's say you've got a few different enemy types, right? 
you give each of those enemy types a letter. So like, you know, enemy A, enemy B, enemy C, you know, and whatever other kinds of non-enemy challenges you have, like a gap, right? Let's say that's D. And then that's those are the tools that you as a game designer now have to, to make this content that you're making. So the first thing in the level wouldn't be A, B, C, D. That's going to be what you're coming towards at the end. The first thing is going to be either A, B, C, or D, right? So that the, the player, even if they've seen these things before, at the beginning of your content, they, they move into it saying, ah, yes, OK, I remember how to handle this aspect of it then your next setup that you're giving them is a more complicated version of that. So it's not just like in the case of enemy A, it's not that your first setup is one enemy A and the second one is two enemy A's. Your second setup is going to be, you know, uh, an enemy A and three enemy B's or two enemy A's and two enemy B's, right? It's a combination of A and B or A and D or whatever, right? And so you're going to make ever more complex combinations of these until you're getting to like, you know, A, C. B, C, D, A, C, D, B. You know, you're doing these, these much more complicated until you've filled the amount of space that you're looking to fill in your level. And now you have a sort of very satisfying ramp that goes from the beginning to the end. And once you have that to start from, you can then iterate on it, which is the next thing I was going to say. Um, one thing that everybody will tell you who's ever made games is how important iteration is in the process and how m most of the time you're not going to get what you need to get done done correctly the first time. And so you're going to have to try uh, many things to get to the end of that. And uh, what I've discovered is that taking something like this, which is a very simple structure to base everything on, and it never comes out the same because what A, B, C, and D are and the the order of the combinations differs every time I do it. Um, what it does is it it puts underneath my eventual iteration on the concept a very solid foundation, a very solid structure, so that when I start building on it, it's not on sand. It's not going to collapse, right? So uh, try to find ways like what I was just talking about to start your designs off on a solid foundation but don't believe that your solid foundation is going to get you immediately to fun because it won't. You, you get that solid foundation down, then you have something to start iterating on, something that's informed by what you want with your designs, what you're aiming for in terms of player complexity and difficulty, and what, uh, what the audience wants, right? You can see them play it, you can make adjustments. So in no case have I ever successfully designed something on paper that came out exactly the way I designed it. It's never happened. And it, I don't think it will ever happen, and I hope it doesn't happen, because the day that happens is the day that something really uh, uh, underformed is going to show up in that game. So, so just remember, iteration is your friend, communication is your friend, and try to base your, your iteration and the things that you decide to do on your your concept of what your players want and on good structured uh, pacing and, and, and game design habits and stuff like that. And those sorts of habits are what I'm eventually going to be getting to in the, the blog post that I'm writing. So that, that was a good question. Uh, let's see, I've got another one here from Ryan Alt. I feel like this may be a question that's addressed in a future article of yours, but regarding weapon archetypes and how they tie in with enemy archetypes, how hard is that to balance in a game where you have to get players to buy individual weapons? Got it. So he's, he's referring to some of, the, um, some of the, the stuff I've been writing in articles. And just to give, in case you guys haven't read that, um, what he means by weapon archetypes and enemy archetypes is, uh, remember how I was saying enemy A, B, C, um, each of those, A, B, and C, is an archetype. It's a, an enemy type or a weapon type that represents a core, uh, core meaningful interaction in your game, right? Uh, in the articles, I say it represents the, the extreme boundaries of your design space, 
right? So your lowest hit point, lowest damage enemy is one archetype, and your highest hit point, highest damage enemy is another archetype, right? Then, you know, the, the variations of the two are also archetypes because they're exploring the very interesting edges of your design. So I think what, what Ryan's asking is um, because uh, when you design an enemy, the player's ability to beat that enemy is essentially the second side of the coin in terms of what you're designing. So when you design an enemy, you're also designing a way to defeat that enemy because your, your player needs to have a countermeasure to whatever it is that you're throwing at them Otherwise, uh, you know, your game will be perceived as unfair. So uh, given that one, an enemy or a, 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 you know, an enemy space and a weapon space are completely intertwined, right? Your, your weapons need to be good for defeating different archetypes of enemies and your enemies need to be good against different archetypes of weapons. How does that tie into where you have to get the players to... Uh, it's so like in Ratchet and Clank, you'd start off with three weapons, and then as they got more bolts in game, they could use the bolts to buy new weapons over the course of the game. And since we had enemies that were relying on the player um, switching weapons to deal with them in a specific way, because the enemies are asking a question, and we want the players to answer that with a weapon, how does that? Uh, how do you balance the fact that they won't necessarily have all of the weapons that you're designing with uh, the fact that they will be in encountering every enemy that you're designing. And I think that's a good question because um, that's something that we ran into a lot on, on both Ratchet and Skylanders. And especially in Skylanders where we would give you three toys with the game and the toys were your weapons, right? They were everything that you could do to defeat an enemy, especially in the early Skylanders games where jumping wasn't an option. So really the individual... Uh, powers and abilities of each Skylander were all that you would have available to you to, uh, to go after the enemies in the game. So to give you an example, Ryan, of how we solved that problem in that game is uh, the three that we shipped the game with, the three characters, we made sure that they represented three weapon archetypes that all of our enemies were based on. Uh, so. To us, that was uh, uh, Skylanders that could shoot a bullet straight, Skylanders that could shoot a bullet indirectly, right, or something like that rains down from the sky, and uh, uh, Skylanders that could attack things at close range, you know, melee or area of effect around the player. And we knew that we had those three basic groups, right, and that generally our enemies would, uh, excuse me, would combat that by uh, doing things in the environment or because the enemy was a specific way to encourage you to, to try to adopt one of those different strategies. So, for example, uh, if, you, uh, if you shot straight ahead, right, that's actually a pretty good way to hit somebody who's across, you know, who's on the other side of a gap from you. You shoot across, you hit them. But if they're on the other side of some cover, right, it's going to go hit the cover and not hit them. So you'll want to switch to one of the guys who can hit like that or down from the sky. Um, and uh, uh, we would have situations where uh, other enemies would get really close to you and try to to interfere with your ability. You know, if you have a, a thing that shoots out far, uh, an enemy that gets close, it might not be able to hit them as well, right? So as well as something that just shoots straight where you're aiming or something that blows up near you. And by placing the enemies in different circumstances or giving them different powers, like having guys that would fly and land, right? You can't jump, so you can only hit them with upper attacks or hit them while they're on the ground. Um, or enemies that stood on destructible towers where you'd have to destroy the tower if you didn't have something that could hit them. Or you'd switch, right? So because we knew that you had the three important weapon archetypes included in the box. We knew that you could you could go after anything in the game, uh, that, that you could defeat any of them using those, those three basic styles. What we did with every other 
Skylander was we made sure that they would address those, uh, you know, one or more of those styles in a different way than another Skylander did. So, for example, if our one of our Wekin archetypes was indirect, right? One of the ways I've talked about uh, a Skylander implementing that is as a lob, or as a rain, or as you know, an explosion everywhere, right? Anything that doesn't require you to aim is still indirect. So we could then lump all of our weapons, our Skylanders, into categories saying, okay, these are Skylanders that are going to be dominant at hitting far away targets that are straight in front of them. These are going to be Skylanders that are dominant at hitting people on ledges. These are going to be Skylanders that are dominant across gaps. And so we, we came up with uh, different balances between those three archetypes and then sort of special things that each Skylander could do that made them unique. And by doing that, since players actually literally had to buy these new weapons, we were able to provide them value in the, the, the core set of weapons and then make the purchase of the additional sets of weapons uh, uh, something that was rewarding to the player. And it works similarly in Ratchet and Clank, except we're not using real money to sell you the additional weapons. What we're doing is... Uh, we're using those additional weapons, which give you ways to solve the same problems more effectively, right? In specific cases, a rocket launcher solves a group across a gap, whereas the blaster solves a single enemy across the gap. You see, they're the same category, but they, um, they're they answering different specific questions based on the setups in your in your levels. So when a, when a person encounters... A, a whole lot of enemies across a gap in the game, sure, they can still go after them with the blaster, and that's fine if that's how they want to do it, or if they've upgraded their blaster to a certain degree. But if they've gone and bought the rocket launcher, they now have a new, more powerful way of exploring those questions and answers. So, in short, unless a weapon is on the critical path, we try to give it more reasons that it solves more specific, more troublesome versions of the same problems that the original weapons solve. And that gives us kind of a, a, a ramp of, of weapons throughout the game. And then in Ratchet & Clank, we didn't do this in, uh, in Skylanders because you were spending real money on the characters, but in Ratchet & Clank, over the course of the game, the weapons that you got at the beginning would increasingly more and more be obsolete as you got to the end because one damage from a blaster, even once you've upgraded it to 10 damage per shot, doesn't do a whole lot against a thousand hit point enemy that you're fighting at the end of the game. So uh, we had to come up with a balance of uh, the how, how much less useful the player's standard weapons are versus how much more useful the weapons they could buy are versus, you know, how much money we're giving the player over time. So uh, to answer your question in a word, it's actually very difficult to do, but once you understand the underpinnings of the different systems, when you understand that the, the enemies and their setups are questions that are answered by your weapons, right? And by adjusting those questions, you adjust which of your weapons are most appropriate. You can then encourage buying over the course of the game. And then also if you need to, right, if it's appropriate for your game, which it was in Ratchet, it wouldn't be in Skylanders. You can uh, uh, adjust over time how effective the original weapons are with the idea of eventually replacing them in the player's arsenal with more effective versions. Excuse me, I have a cold. All right. Uh, all right, so here's another question from Oliver. Uh, my question is essentially twofold, which he says is being furtively greedy. Uh, first, you seem to have a progressive player-oriented design philosophy. So how has your approach to game design evolved since you started in the industry, if at all? Okay, so uh, first off, the my design philosophy is player-oriented. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. I mean, if you've listened to the stuff I've been saying so far, it comes across. Uh, when people ask me in interviews what my design philosophy it is, is it's that designers exist to essentially be the voices of the player 
in the design process, right? Nobody else is paid to speak for the player except me, right? I come in here saying, okay, look, we really want to do this thing and it's really cool, but we're going to be trying to sell this to people who don't want that, right? So we need to come up with a way to take this thing that we're really passionate about and make it something that they can also be really passionate about. Um, and so I learned that at Insomniac, which was my first game design gig, and I learned that from people like Brian Allgaier and Colin Munson and Mark Cerny, who were all very solidly entrenched in this uh, player-oriented design philosophy. Um, I've often felt it's kind of like a kung fu lineage, right? Where you know, uh, the we have Grandmaster Mark Cerny who handed it down to Master Allgaier who handed it down to me. Sometimes through, you know, black belt Colin Munson, right? I feel this kind of uh, uh, debt to the people who taught me how to design this way. So, to me, it doesn't feel like. Uh, I have had an intense evolution in terms of how player oriented I am. It feels mainly like my evolution uh, towards game design has been more shedding my preconceptions of what I think is fun and what I think is good in preference of what I discover that players think is fun and that players think is good. And I discover this by watching people play the game and then not telling them they're stupid when they can't do it, right? Like uh, in uh, Ratchet and Skylanders, and basically every other game made in the industry, at least two or three times a project, we have a point where the game gets put in the hands of gamers. And we get to find out how many of our ideas are uh, either wrong for the audience or so inelegantly executed that it's not possible for us to do them correctly in the amount of time that we have. So for example, in the developer commentary podcasts uh, that Tony and I did for a long time, we would often talk about how we took a mechanic into a, a focus test and the focus testers couldn't handle it so we had to change it. And I think that gave a lot of people the impression that, uh, man, we vastly overestimated the intelligence of people and we need to pull that back. And that's not actually how we mean it. What, what actually happens is we vastly uh, underestimated how much communication we need to do to the player in order to get them to understand what we're asking them to do, right? Like, my, my approach is that games are, are questions that the players answer, right? It's conversation. If you ask a question and you say, Harbella flirbida burbida, and you, then you get a pissed off because the player doesn't know what you're asking them to do, that's kind of a move, right? You're not actually, you're not actually playing with the player. You're dictating to the player, right? Like you're, you're overwhelmingly telling them, no, you're wrong. This is what's fun. And I see that a lot in designers saying, well, I think it's fun, right? So why do I have to change it? Right? And the answer is, because it's not your, no, oh, excuse me. I'm going to have to put a warning at the beginning. That's not your job. It's not your job to decide whether it's fun. It's just your job to make it fun for the people that you're making the game for. Now, that being said, if you're making the game for yourself, it is absolutely your your job then to decide if it's fun. It just uh, I've never had the the luxury of being able to make a game for myself. So, uh, when I talk about things like this, I'm talking from the perspective of somebody seeing somebody trying to play with another person and being that kid who's impossible to play with on the playground, right? Like, uh, hey, we're going to play, but I'm going to make up all the rules so that I always win, right? And then, so, screw that. Who wants to play with that guy? So uh, I would say that, that generally, uh, if anything, my approach has become more player-centric and less me-centric. Um, then, uh, then I think it was when I started because when I started, my ideal was, all right, I think it's fun when games are hard. So how many times can I kill the player, right? But it's really, really easy to kill players. It's 
so super easy to kill them. Uh, like, you know, if, if you're if you're God and you remove all the oxygen in the earth, you've just beat all the players, right? So that's that cannot possibly be the game you're playing as a game designer. Uh, for most creative agendas, right? Uh, there are certain creative agendas where that that actually is your job as a game designer. Uh, you know, where where uh, uh, you're trying to create something, you're you're essentially trying to create a a wall for people to climb over, and that's a completely different style of game design. That's not what I'm talking about because that doesn't tend to be the, the games I make. The games I make are for an audience. And it's important that that audience like it because otherwise there's no reason to make it because we're not making it for us. We're making it for them, if that makes any sense. And uh, and so I've had to, to find ways to, to take what I want out of consideration without losing what I'm passionate about, which is the whole reason why I'm making the game in the first place, right? So I just said... There's no reason to make the game except to make it for the players. Well, the reason to make it for the players is to get excited about being able to make that great game for them, right? It's to get excited about being able to play with them in this way. It, that's how it seems to me for the games that I make for people. Because they're generally not, you know, like if I, if I were making games for me, I would be making Skyrim, which I'm not saying isn't like this, but but generally I'm not making the games that I want. And so when I make... Ratchet, which is a very specific type of game for a very specific type of gamer, uh, I'm not trying to do the same things that are in the games that I personally think are my favorite, right? You see what I'm saying? So over time, what I want has had to fall away, and then I've had to come in and substitute that with what will motivate me to be interested to do this. So, so I'd say probably the most important thing that I've learned is how to be excited that other people are having fun. And uh, I learned a lot of that just doing game mastering and Dungeons and Dragons, but uh, it's the same sort of thing, right? When you're playing with people uh, and you have all of the power, it's trivial to win. What is not trivial is to have fun playing with that other person. And so uh, unless you're creating a game where the social contract is to create a wall that that different people can climb and see who climbs the wall, which is its own set of fun. Uh, unless that's your creative agenda, like me, you're probably going to need to find a way to be passionate about uh, what you're designing for somebody else and learn how to lose the, the parts of, of, of your agenda that don't match the creative agenda of the game you're making. So it's kind of a long-winded and probably too philosophical and I'm guessing easily misunderstood way of answering your question, but I'm not sure I could do a much better job of it right now. So uh, if that didn't get to this, the, the source of it or if anybody has any questions, please send these on for the next version of this because I, I, this is an, inter an, era, uh, an area I'd be more interested in, in elaborating on. Um, okay, so here's another question. And this is the last question. This is from Ryan Ald again. Um, how often do you get game development related questions that have absolutely nothing to do with your work? I feel like a lot of people have different definitions of each job title and would be prone to doing that. Uh, I think you're right. Um, there's a... There's a... a the industry has very specific terms for very specialized uh, artists, right? Groups of people making different art on a game, everywhere from producers to, uh, you know, uh, visual artists and animators, right? Um, and uh, for people who don't make games and work every day in or with those roles, it can be very unclear what uh, uh, what kind of questions to address to who. And I, I, I get why that would be difficult. So maybe the best way to answer this question would be to be to talk about the different game development roles that there are, the different specialities, and 
maybe drill a little down into that and say sort of what what is covered with my work at the very least uh, to shed some light sort of on what it is that the kind of things that I do versus what somebody else does. And I'm actually going to get into this a little more during the podcast, which Tony and I just recorded last night. Uh, we talked about uh, how it feels to be a programmer and describe your job to people who don't know what a game programmer is and how it feels to be a game designer and describe your job to people who don't know what a game designer is and what the frustrations are around that. And, uh, and generally what it is, I think first, first and foremost, there's a perception that games are made by one person, right? Or a couple people. And with the exception of indie titles, that's almost never true. Uh, I mean, there's a famous quote from IGN where it said, um, quote, uh, they were quoting Warren Spector, right? And he said, uh, the, the video games press has a tendency to attribute the creation of games to a single person said Warren Spector, the creator of Deus Ex, right? So there's this, there's this incredibly internalized sense to, to want to know which single person was behind the thing that you liked about the art that you liked. And when it comes to games, unless you're talking about very focused indie titles, that is generally not how it works. Uh, we talk about some exceptions with, with, with studios where that that is how it works, but uh, generally that, that's not what happens. Generally, you have a whole list of people who have a whole lot of different skills, each contributing in their way to what makes the whole thing good. So like Tony was saying, when people ask him what he did on World of Warcraft, right, he has to say, oh, yes, you see how all the characters have armor? Well, I created the system so that the artist could put the armor on them without wasting a bunch of time. And here's the thing, as a game maker, I think, holy shit, that's really useful. Uh, sorry, I gotta gotta keep the swearing down, but holy crap, that's useful, right? Uh, and as a person who played the game, you're like, well, how does that translate into how I moved my fingers, right? So, uh, in a very high level sense, right? Uh, what I do is game design, and what game designers are is they get they, they, they sort of start the project off, right? They're given a concept, like uh, we're making a shooter for this audience, and it, these are the characters, and here's the story. Maybe you get that, right? Uh, you don't always get that. Sometimes you come up with any of those things, but you're given a set of parameters to work within that someone has already decided on. And uh, within those parameters, it's your job to figure out how to create uh, uh, you're creating the structure that the content will go in. So if you're a, a if we're making a building, game designers are like architects, right? You're coming up with blueprints, but generally you're not going on to the construction site and nailing things down. And generally, if you did that, the construction workers would get really upset with you because you'd be doing all kinds of things that were not uh, appropriate for a, a you know that 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 were more appropriately given to the expertise of a, a construction worker than to a, a, a architect, right? So, as a game designer, I am coming up with this enemy should go here, and here's why, and here's what the enemy should do. And then after the enemy does that, it should wait for a second and then run over here, and then here's what it should do then, right? I'm coming up with the the questions that the game is going to be ask, uh, asking the players, and then in very idealistic terms, coming up with the answers that the players will be able to use. So I'm coming up with the blueprints for all of that. Then once, generally, this isn't how every studio works, but the designers do all of that, and then that gets handed off to a group of people who start to make it work. So programmers come in and they make it so that your wacky, stupid ideas can actually be on the screen and look good and run at a, a good speed and 
be playable by your audience, right? And it's given to artists who are actually building the buildings that you've said, I, I, need, a, I need a shack to be here, right? But now they actually have to figure out what that looks like and what it, how it ties into the fiction and all that stuff, right? So they're, they're doing the visual work of creating an environment. That's called an environment artist. Uh, and uh, there's also other people who are creating the characters you've created. I, I might have come up with an enemy that has a gun arm and shoots these things. And then there's an artist out there who has to decide how that enemy is going to look, right? And that's given to an artist who's going to actually build that enemy either as a sprite or as a 3D model to go in the game, right? So they're creating all of that stuff, and that's stuff we call assets. Um, there's also audio developers who are creating uh, sound effects, sound effects developers. There's um, music creators uh, and voice actor um, the people dealing with voiceover and and then the the voice actors who are doing the acting uh and so there's all those kinds of specialists off on the audio end and then once all of that stuff the, once the assets get created they get passed down through the programmers uh to whoever's going to be implementing uh and, and making that stuff like uh you have all of the assets right now someone has to tie all those together. They have to take the model of the enemy that you've created and take all the animations that have been created for that enemy and the behaviors that the game designers have created and actually tie all of those things together and make them work in a game. And depending on the studio you're at, that's either a gameplay programmer or a designer, a scripter, right? someone who's actually coming in and uh, taking the metal and having it meet the road. Uh, and then after that gets done, there's, uh, uh, or sorry, while that's all getting done, there are people who are making sure that, like you've just seen that from the one thing I've done, right, the level I've created, hundreds and hundreds of assets have been created, hundreds of sound effects, music, uh, you know, how many times do different characters need to say, I need a clip, <laughs> right? How many VO clips do you need? Uh, there's these, thousands and thousands of assets that have been created somebody needs to track all of that and make sure it's getting created and that nothing's falling off right because if something falls off early in the pipeline it's going to screw everything off down there and those people are called producers they're the people who are to a large extent keeping the big concept of the game in their head and making sure that each individual person is doing what's necessary to achieve that larger concept and it's not just the larger concept that the designers are holding. They're also holding the larger concept that the, the publisher is holding in terms of business strategy or that uh, the individual studio is holding in terms of uh, creating an eventual portfolio, right? So they're thinking on a completely different level, but also thinking specifically about how to get everything made and get to the people who need to get it next, right? So that's sort of how producers usually work. And then... At a higher level, right, there's people on the publisher level who are doing all of these same things, right? There's uh, designers who are who, who know what the publisher is trying to accomplish with the title, what their creative agenda is, who are working with the designers at the developer trying to help them understand and achieve that because the success of the game goes hand in hand with the success of the creative agenda of, of the, the, the people who are are handling the publishing and the money and stuff like that too. So there's designers and artists and programmers and all of these people working for the publisher trying to also help in addition to it, achieving the developer's creative agenda, achieving the, the publisher's creative agenda. So you've got all those roles duplicated. And then on top of that, You've got groups of people who are uh, associated with metagame aspects like uh, marketing and uh, uh, public relations, uh, talking with uh, reviewers and media and getting the word out. There's people whose job it is to meet with retailers and show them how cool the game is so that they can uh, effectively uh, convince those retailers to buy as many copies as you can, because there's two ways to make money in games. One is selling copies to retailers, and the other is selling copies to gamers. And uh, most people don't know this, but we don't generally make any money 
uh, in retail by selling copies to gamers because um, uh, or sorry we, uh, to selling copies to retailers because every like if we oversell to retailers we have to buy back the things that they don't sell most industries if a retailer buys too many things they're stuck with it and then they put it on clearance right uh, if Activision ships too many copies of Call of Duty to a retailer and the retailer can't sell them all Activision is required to buy them back from the retailer so it's important that retailers understand uh, you know how to sell this to sell this through them to the players otherwise you know even though we're making a lot of money on paper by selling these to retailers we may not make that in the end because we just get it all back right and then you end up with a situation where you have a whole bunch of games going into a landfill right? so um, and then on top of that you've got another layer of people who their job is to make sure that the 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 business structure that's keeping all of these people that I just mentioned employed runs, right? And those are the executives. They're the people who are are coming up with the creative agenda for how your company and all of its employees can continue to do what it's doing over time. And their creative agenda also needs to be recognized in the game that's created. So you can sort of start to see how what I mentioned earlier on, how, how generally especially if you're making a game on a large team and not just for yourself, you're often creating based on a creative agenda in which you are a small part. Your creative agenda is a building block of the larger creative agenda, and that larger one cannot exist without the smaller one, but neither can the smaller one exist without the larger one. So uh, I think you can kind of see from that description how complicated it gets to describe to people who does what in games because that model I just described to you might be true of one game company and then at another game company they might call everything something completely different so uh, it's true that lots of people do ask me questions that don't have much to do with my work but because my work and my creative agenda is so tightly intertwined with the work and the creative agendas of every other specialist and corporately uh, the group of people making the games that uh, I find especially as a game designer who has to interface with all of these people it sort of becomes my job to explain to people how this works so a lot of the times when I get questions that are not specifically about me I try to answer them as best I can or at least to get people that I know to answer them and so uh, I'm probably answering it this way because that's what the podcast I'm going to be doing is mostly about is talking with other disciplines about what doing their job is like and how that relates to being a game designer and how as a game designer it is as important to me now and this wasn't the case at the beginning so this is sort of answering Oliver's question too it's as important to me now how my creative agenda fits in with everybody else's creative agenda as my creative agenda used to be when I started. And that's been probably the biggest shift for me. And so since I see the, the ultimate entirety of the agenda as, my, as being relevant to me, even though I do get questions that are not relevant to my work, they are in a way, right? So it still, still counts. So, um, I want to apologize to Nikhil for not writing his question down. I thought for some reason it would just still be here. So next time, again, I'll get to that question, uh, Nikhil. Or maybe you can just post it again. Uh, either way, I promise I'll get to it next time, one way or another. Uh, but those are all the questions I have for now. Uh, let me just double check. Yeah, that's all the questions I have. So uh, hopefully this worked out and everybody likes this. Uh, I'm going to open it up a lot sooner. Last time I opened it up about a week ahead this time um, so that more people can get their questions in. But uh, I also want to ask, uh, I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out what to do for the other Q&A that's going to happen, the, the one that was supposed to be a written Ask Me Anything series. And uh, because I couldn't find the technology that I wanted to, to, to run those, 
I'm thinking about just doing a second Q&A session, but I feel like that would devalue the $5 tier because that's the main perk. So if anybody has any ideas on this, I'm thinking of either making, like coming up with a new perk for the $5 tier that would uh, 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 be as valuable and then making the two Q&A sessions a month just the thing for everybody or coming up with a new thing to do for that milestone that doesn't have anything to do with Q&A uh, just to separate it. Because I think even though in my head they were very separated, it turns out that they're without the technology to do them the way I wanted, they're actually kind of the same thing. And uh, I don't want to devalue the, the stuff that I'm already giving to people. So if you have any feedback on, on any of that and how that would be good, please come to the Patreon page and post there or let me know on Twitter. Um, the that Either of those are probably the best. Uh, the Google Plus stuff I don't check very much. So uh, Twitter or the Patreon page, uh, just please let me know if you have any feedback. So thanks again, everybody. I just want to say how continually humbling it is that people are willing to pay me to do stuff like this because all I'm doing is turning on a camera and running my mouth. So to me, this is this is something that's really uh, it's really interesting and uh, I'm very glad that I get to do this and that I don't have to be constantly looking for for other things to do to occupy my time. So thanks everybody very much and I'm looking forward to the next one next month and uh, Hope to see all of you there and, and answer more of your questions. So, bye.